Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, bon matin, mesdames et messieurs. It's great to be here for your uh, CEO's planning uh, session. I know Chief Crawford and I were looking forward to coming to spend time with you and sort of give you that holistic look from uh, the formation. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being your commander for one year, and I must say I'm extremely proud to be the commander of cadets and junior Canadian Rangers. And uh, having been a cadet uh, when I was young, as well as the chief, very passionate about the program. It means so much. It had such an impact on my career of the foundation of leadership, teamwork, citizenship, confidence building, you name it. I, I owe so much to the cadet program, and I'm sure there's many of you that were previous cadets. Let's have a show of hands. Who is a previous cadet? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's, I'm thrilled to see uh, over 160 uh, corps and squadrons uh, represented here. You have COs, you have representatives, you have area OICs, zone training officers, as well as representatives uh, from uh, the various RCSUs. So these CO planning sessions, I think, are so important, where you talk about the networking and being able to talk to your other COs and core representatives of looking at lessons learned, best practices, Right now, don't feel that you're on an island by yourself. You have all these people that may be going through similar circumstances, and you can talk with them about new initiatives. So I encourage you, networking is key in my career as well as the Chiefs. A huge part of that is networking and working with each other to make sure you accomplish the mission. So thrilled to be here. Uh, we're gonna go through uh, some things in the presentation, about 30 minutes. I wanna allow a lot of time for uh, for question and answer. Slido was something that uh, uh, the general officers, when we get together, we call it the GoFo uh, seminar, general officer, flag officer seminar each year. We use Slido where we ask questions to the CDS and the deputy minister on very pointed uh, discussion points. So I look forward to you putting uh, your comments in there and the number of likes definitely moves it up the queue. Uh, and uh, we'll answer uh, the questions to the best of our ability if we don't have the answers, we'll definitely uh, find them out uh, from my staff. So uh, in the, the presentation, we're going to be looking at the five W's as well as how, getting into the uh, command and control structure, talk about my commander's intent and direction and guidance, um, discussing uh, authority, responsibility and accountability and expectations of uh, commanding officers. And the chief and I will be uh, alternating uh, throughout uh, the presentation uh, with the dialogue and I do look forward to your Q&A so please start thinking about questions that uh, have been uh, burning in your mind for uh, the last uh, year or last uh, six months. Thank you very much. Next slide. Thanks, Earl. Thank you, Chief. So the five W's. Who we are. The National Cadet and Junior Canadian Rangers Support Group. We are an L2 command. I report to the Vice Chief of Defence Staff, Lieutenant General Lanfier. I had my bilat uh, last week with him. He is very passionate about the program, having been the commander of the Army, and he wants to support as much as he can of ensuring that we have an outstanding youth development program, which we do. 53,000 cadets, for those not aware, 4,300 junior Canadian Rangers, and approximately 9,000 staff. Um, uh, it's always incredible when I start talking to my fellow GOFOs uh, and senior leadership that we have 1,109 corps and squadrons. It's incredible. So when I'm talking to the service chiefs, the three stars, they're amazed by the magnitude and scope of this organization and saying, Dave, how can we help? We want to be part of the cadet program. When we changed, so for those not aware, we are a formation under one commander, myself, and I report directly to the vice. This came about in 2015, so we are new, we're in our infancy, four years, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary in 2020. And I just want to emphasize, I came from another command, two Canadian Air Division in Winnipeg, and that was a fairly new formation as well. It was six years old when I came in, and there was still issues and challenges that needed to be dealt with, so baby steps. So something to keep in mind for you that not everything is solved right away, it takes time, but I must say 
since my year in command, I've been extremely impressed with the positive progress uh, that we've seen as a formation holistically with the five regions. Why we changed? Why did we uh, form a formation? As you know, it was a directorate before. There was an audit in 2013 by ADMRS, and some of the key deficiencies that were highlighted was command and control, limited financial oversight, and ensuring that more money is aimed towards the delivery of the program instead of overhead. So right now, we are at 91% of the budget that is, that is targeted to delivery of the program for the cadets and the JCRs, which I think uh, we've made significant progress. Next slide. Chief. Thank you, sir. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity for us to be able to uh, uh, sit here and uh, share with all of you folks uh, some, of the, uh, some of the strategic level uh, uh, setup and, and guidance and how we are structured uh, with you. So thank you very much. Um, so in order to know who we are, we got to know what we look like. And so we flashed up this map here uh, and I'm just going to talk very quickly. Is everybody in this room, just by show of hands, is everybody in this room completely familiar with our formation, our organization? So there's, so there's, it's, it's varying degrees. And it's important, regardless of what organization you are part of in, this or in, our, in our formation, uh, it's important that we all understand what the bigger picture is. So we're just going to look up, uh, if I can draw your attention, can you see that map in the back of the room, uh, folks? Great, thank you. Uh, just draw your attention to the slide up here. So um, we'll go from, uh, let's, let's go from west to east. Uh, we've broken it down, so we have RCSU Pacific. RCSU Pacific, uh, essentially they are, so we're five regional headquarters, similar to the one that you work for now, five regional headquarters across Canada, plus the Junior Canadian Ranger Program. So RCSU Pacific, just BC. Now, the breakdown of the map as we move over may look strange, but it's broken down by demographic, not by provinces or whatnot. It's by numbers of folks that we've got, numbers of cadets. Uh, so they're located in CFB Esquimalt in Victoria. RCSU Northwest, uh, located CFB Winnipeg in Manitoba, that, which you're all familiar with. And you are, by the way, in a lot of cases, in a lot of the things that we do, the um, uh, the litmus test for us, uh, because of your, your, your geographic separation and, and uh, you know, the three provinces and the whole north, uh, it's huge. So a lot of times we will look at Northwestern when we are uh, talking about various things and planning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we have RCSU Central. That's our largest region. It has our largest population of cadets. Uh, they're located at CFB Borden in Angus, out near Barrie. Eastern region is Quebec, our francophone, for the most part, our francophone uh, RCSU. And they, their regional boundaries are just that, uh, just the province of Quebec. And then we have RCSU uh, Atlantic, which essentially covers everything from Quebec East, all the Atlantic provinces. So that's our breakdown. Our national headquarters is, at, uh, is in Ottawa. Which is, called, uh, which is at NDHQ. Now, NDHQ isn't a building. NDHQ is a region. So uh, bear that in mind. And we're one of those units embedded in the, in the National Capital Region. And uh, that is the headquarters that commands our formation. Next, we will talk about what? Next slide, please. Uh, we'll talk about the what. Um, what are some of the benefits of the program under the new configuration? We're no longer, as a commander said, a directorate, we're a command. And that's huge. To not break it down in, to go into detail, over, uh, over lengthy detail, the bottom line is we are now a command-centric organization, which means General Cochran answers to the vice, as he indicated, but he actually commands this organization. As a directorate before, directorate of cadets, that is not a command-driven function. That is an organization that is more staff driven, that supports a program. So we really didn't have any major structure where all the regions were underneath the divisions or the wings, the Navy on each coast, 
And uh, so there was some challenges to, to how we work collectively as a program, as a cadet program uh, uh, managed. We have one unified voice. That is critical. Uh, it's not RCSU PAC, RCSU Central, Atlantic, with different challenges. We now have a unified voice when we take it up to the, uh, to the senior strategic level through uh, the commander that he can table things on behalf of all of us, and that is very, very critical. Accountability. That's a huge one, and we, we will hear that throughout the, uh, throughout the day today. Uh, you will hear accountability brought up several times, and that is huge. The only way a program as successful as ours, as huge as ours, can move forward with success uh, is to be accountable for every single aspect of the program. The other issue that is extremely positive for us is we have a voice. We have a voice at the table. Uh, we didn't before. We are a level two command in the Canadian Armed Forces under the Vice Chief of Defence Staff. So when the commander is sitting at a table and they are they're discussing you name it, anything that concerns the Canadian Forces, the cadet voice is at that table. I just returned, I just met the commander in Toronto, we flew out here together. Uh, I was for the last week in Quebec City, and I was at the uh, Canadian Armed Forces Chief Warrant Officers Conference. There's only so many uh, master or Chief Warrant Officers that go to this conference, it's a senior conference, and every issue affecting Chief Warrant Officers is addressed there and we talk about it for a week with a lot of PD. Uh, I'm on that council now, and that's important, so I can bring things forward with reference to our program uh, that are very, very important, that are of interest, and that may impact other organizations in the Canadian Forces. So we've got a seat at the table, very important. Um, so what's in it for you? How does this affect yourselves? Uh, well now, a decision that you make ripples across the Canadian forces. That's a good thing, but it's a double-edged sword, right? So it's really important that the decisions you make at the core and squadron level uh, are thought through and, uh, and, uh, and challenged before you actually go to implementation. Challenge yourself with your staff because uh, something that happens in Pacific shoots right up to our headquarters in a nanosecond, and, uh, and uh, that's a good thing, but it's, uh, like I say, sometimes we see some pretty challenging, uh, challenging things that come up to the headquarters. Uh, we have better visibility on the program. You know, a lot of people don't know how we're structured, the slide that we just showed before. A lot of people don't know, uh, you know, that we have 1,109 corps and squadrons across this country. A lot of people don't know that we have over 1,300 boats, excluding canoes and sailboats. We didn't know that. I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we did not have a grip of our equipment before we stood up. We're still working that, that sphere, but we're getting a grip of our stuff. And that's, that is, at the end of the day, accountability. We have better command and control over the program. And the other one that's, uh, that's really quite important is uh, the RCSU COs are accountable directly to the commander, who is accountable to the Vice Chief of Defence Staff. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are accountable to your COs at the Regional uh, Cadet Support Units. So we have a very clear, simple line of command that can get information passed up and down very, very quickly. And, and the other thing here that has been a plus is we have enhanced opportunities. We've got to think outside the box. Um, at the Corps and Squadron level, there's nothing wrong with sea cadets, army cadets, air cadets getting together, doing exercises. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. By the way, the cadets tell us that, right? The cadets tell us that all the time. It's so great to learn from other corps and squadrons and other uh, environments. Well, we can do that, and that's not wrong. Um, we have opportunities for CIC officers if you have a specialty and we need a certain specialty at one of the uh, CTCs uh, in uh, out west well we can we can bring you there for the summer and work out west so these are critical things we're not in silos 
We're not small organizations. We are one massive organization and we can support ourselves across uh, regional boundaries and across the country to make sure that we give the best possible program, provide the best possible program for the youth of Canada. And on that note, sir, I will hand it back over to you. Thanks, Chief. <clears throat> okay, what are, sorry, chain of command. So uh, the Chief uh, provided uh, some initial uh, thoughts on this and I wanted to show you just a overview of the organizational chart where hopefully you've seen this before where Commander, myself, and then going down to the five regional cadet support unit COs. They have a direct line to me. So Lieutenant Colonel Letelier Denis, I know very well and he has a direct line whether it's through email or or giving me a call if certain issues that uh, arise in his region. As the commander, my responsibility is managing the youth program for the Canadian Armed Forces on behalf of the CDS and the Vice Chief of Defence Staff. And that includes things such as policy, budget, training, admin, and support. But a key part of it is the RCSUs, the five regions. Previously, before the uh, command stood up, it was in silos. Having been here a year now in command, I've seen a lot of things that have happened in silos via regions, as well as uh, in certain corps and squadrons. And that's where we're looking to look at a holistic approach so the cadets have a similar experience across Canada where it isn't in specific aspects or specific cities or locations. Um, the holistic approach, I know uh, the RCSU CEOs, the command teams hear about it a lot from me, and I'm always looking for consistency. The chief mentioned about equipment. Equipment, right now, to give you an appreciation, we do not have a life cycle material manager in my strategic headquarters. That's being changed. I need somebody to holistically look at all of the equipment, whether it's 20,000 rifles, 1,300 boats, you name it, we need a holistic approach so the regions are not all doing it in isolation. And I've talked to the command teams about that where everybody has great initiatives, but we need to make sure that we're marching forward together from an efficiency and effectiveness uh, standpoint. So big thing I wanna get at for chain of command for you is your boss is the RCSU CEO to myself. I know you need to know your zone training officer in area OIC, but if there's issues and challenges, I'm expecting you to advise your RCSU CO because usually I'm getting a phone call or an email from him very quickly. As you can imagine with social media and everything else, the Globe and Mail test, there's so many things that are occurring out there. One small aspect in your core and squadron could impact the entire organization strategically. There's several circumstances where I've been involved with the minister's office or the CDS's office of trying to answer questions that have funneled up to the senior levels and working with the CEOs of the RCSUs going, okay, let's get to the bottom of this and let's see how we can resolve it. One thing I would recommend to the CEOs of the corps and squadrons is if you see an issue brewing, get involved. We want it resolved at the lowest possible level. If you see that this may have a serious impact, make sure your RCSU CO is aware. One thing I've told my command teams is I don't like being blindsided. Since being CO at 426 Squadron way back in 2006, that is one of my mantras of, I wanna help avoid any significant issues and if I know things in advance or at the earliest opportunity, I can be proactive in helping resolve the issue. Uh, you have no idea how quickly things get to the CDS and VCDS, where you may be at your core and squad and thinking, nah, it's not that big of an issue. Think about it of how could that impact the entire organization, the cadet organization. It's food for thought. Next slide. So mission, I think most of you have seen uh, the mission of uh, the uh, the uh, NCJCR support group. Um, I, I'll just underline the, the key comments of development and preparation 
of youth for the transition to adulthood. This is key for Canada. It being the largest youth development program in Canada, we are preparing future leaders in Canada. So I, I can't emphasize enough of what responsibilities you're being given at the core and squadron level. You are at the grassroots. You have the direct contact with the cadets and the senior cadets that you're mentoring. Next slide. Vision. As a formation for both cadets and the JCR program, as you can see, the delivery of cadet and JCR programs in the most effective and efficient manner possible. What I'm looking to you is, if there's new ideas, let's get them out there, let's discuss them. Is this more efficient and effective to implement in the program? And these type of CO planning sessions are key where you can energize and talk with your colleagues of this is the way we do things in our core squadron. Maybe you could consider that. And that's where the area OICs, the zone training officers, up to the COs of the RCSUs are so critical. The cadet program, this is where you take ownership, ladies and gentlemen, ensuring that it's a program of choice and that we are preparing them to become leaders of tomorrow. I must say I was at, uh, with the chief, 17 of 22 CTCs uh, this summer. It was uh, quite busy, but it was amazing. Seeing the delivery of the program, seeing the staff cadets in their leadership roles of uh, the passion, the dedication, it was incredible to see the delivery of the program. I was quite encouraged, uh, like the chief, coming after the summer of the CTC season, which makes up over $70 million of our program. It's running extremely well. We have some challenges, yes, but overall we need to remember of the product that we, uh, we are delivering of the future leaders of Canada. Next slide. Commander's intent. So you may have seen this slide before, but the key focus is on the cadets and the JCRs, preparing them to be effective leaders and ensuring a safe and respectful environment. So Operation Honor and HISB, for example, with CTCs, I just briefed uh, the vice uh, last week, there was a slight decline in numbers of uh, SIRs uh, this summer with regards to HISB and I commended uh, to the vice of the training that is being delivered to both the adult staff, the staff cadets, and the cadets of what is considered acceptable and unacceptable behavior, uh, as well as them signing a code of conduct sheet. And I expect similar at the corps and squadrons. With 1,109 corps and squadrons, I know that we are not completely consistent out there, but I would encourage you to make sure that you have the training involved for your staff cadets or your senior cadets, because that is where they're gonna hear if there's some issues going on with the cadet cadre that's, uh, that's at your unit. Build and deliver quality programs that are achievable, affordable, and sustainable. To give you an appreciation, we have a budget of over $200 million. Okay, last year we spent within 0.2% of the budget. As the vice uh, told me, he goes, Dave, that's the platinum level. I was extremely impressed with the management, the financial oversight of the J8 staffs, both at uh, the strategic headquarters as well as uh, the RCSUs and down. So we're doing well with the over 200 million, but we do have pressures. So we have pressures in the neighborhood of $8 million uh, this fiscal year. So that's where priorities come into play of making sure of, okay, what are the mandatory events that we have to do and what are the optional or discretionary activities. And that's where I need your leadership at the, C at the core and squadron where you need to be making the decision. You are accountable for this. Um, achievable and affordable. I guess the achievable is we want fun, exciting, challenging, uh, experiences, but we need to make sure safety remains at the core. Um, I know we're led by passionate, well-trained adult staff and volunteers, but it comes from you, the leadership of uh, the corps and squadrons. Ensuring program success. So uh, continuous improvement. I know a lot has been going on with working groups since uh, the audit of 2013, and we are moving out on certain areas. 
And the big thing is lessons learned. So to give you an example with the cadet training centers, a key lesson learned document is being prepared for myself to look at consi consistently what are the issues that are going on at the CTCs that we need to help resolve for summer 2020. And I'll be looking at that in other similar circumstances across the formation. Effective stewardship of resources, and that's financial oversight. As you'll see that we're uh, getting uh, better at our financial oversight where I believe when the regions were working in silos, uh, there may not have been the uh, scrutiny that uh, was uh, being done as it is now. And I am accountable to the VCDS for the spending of the $200 million plus. To give you an appreciation in the VICE's budget, we take over 60% of the budget. So when we go and uh, brief on our business plan and the pressures that we have, we need to take that into perspective when I hear of other organizations asking for $50,000 and they're being denied and I'm asking for $8 million. So you, you need to realize that there are some significant pressures across all of the CAF funding wise. It's not just the cadet organization. And I need to understand that when I'm talking to the deputy vice and the vice of how critical things are from a funding standpoint. Cooperation with key partners. I know we have a follow on slide to, to discuss uh, regarding the league. I guess as COs, you are responsible for overseeing your core squadron. Support from the key partners is critical, such as the leagues and cooperation. That's where you need to work with your support committees to make sure that the cadets remain at the forefront, where it may, remains fun, exciting, challenging, but safety always needs to remain paramount. Next slide. Center of gravity. Um, the cadet experience, full stop. Okay, my center of gravity is the cadet experience and a key element of that is youth leading youth. I saw, we saw this in spades at the CTCs uh, this summer, uh, seeing this, uh, the staff cadets and how motivated and pumped they were of the leadership roles that they were being given and the mentorship being provided by uh, the, uh, the CIC officers. Let's continue to do that at the core and squadron level with the senior cadets. I know many of the corps and squadrons are already, in, already doing that, but I encourage you to continue to develop our youth where we're preparing them for the future and you can be key mentors to setting them up for success. I know I still have memories of the CEO of my Air Cadet Squadron in Toronto of how the mentorship he provided to me and hit, helped me in my career as I as I developed and grew to becoming a Brigadier General. So I still hold that in high regard. Cadet safety a priority. Here are looking at sanctioned events as well as proper supervision. And that's where the COs come into play. Where there are some things that come to our headquarters that surprise us. And uh, one of my first questions is, is this a sanctioned event? And who was the supervisor? Okay, so always have that in the back of your mind that you are running your core and squadron. It's not somebody else, it is you, the CEO of the core and the squadron. And some of the skills development, the key ones being leadership, teamwork, and citizenship. Next. Commander's direction and guidance, fiscal year 1920. So I sent out a DNG uh, letter in May. Uh, how many people have seen that DNG letter? That's encouraging. Those that haven't, uh, please let uh, your RCSU CO know and I'm sure he'll find uh, the link uh, to, to get that to you. Um, some of the key things that I wrote down there for this fiscal year where um, one thing I've found in the year as commander is there's a lot of rocks. So when, I, uh, when a question comes up and just so you know, we have a daily update every morning with my deputy, my COS and my chief and uh, it's always interesting some of the things that are going on across the formation. And like you, I need to prioritize. I know I don't have all the staff uh, numbers that I would like, so I need to prioritize and go, that is a key issue that I need to work on. 
So examples here are, for example, an identity project. Coming from uh, the regular force, I was a cadet growing up, so I understood about cadet activities, but I did not have an appreciation of the magnitude and scope of the cadet organization. 1,109 core squadrons, over 9,000 staff, 53,000 cadets, 4,300 JCRs. Like, it's incredible. When I talk to people in the reg or P res about the scope of this organization, they are amazed and they're impressed. And they're going, Dave, how can we help? So with me, I'm trying that we get into the OODA loop of the CAF, the Canadian Armed Forces, but also Can Canadians writ large. So I know my public affairs, Major James, uh, he'll be helping develop with us a way ahead for an identity project of making sure that we get ourselves on the map and we give an awareness to both, both Canadians as well as Canadian Armed Forces members. <clears throat> Part of this is uh, the Canadian Armed Forces FAMIL, CAF FAMIL. I'm big on CAF FAMIL, as uh, Denis knows. Um, I'm always interested, I do follow social media uh, to the uh, to the chagrin of some of my staff sometimes, but I do follow social media. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'm big on making sure that we're highlighting all the great things that we're doing with the rest of the Canadian Armed Forces, where whether it's uh, going on a flight or whether they're doing an exercise uh, with uh, one of the reserve units. Key, make sure that information gets fed, fed up to the RCSU because I want to be able to, to monitor that as well as engage my level and higher at the Army, Navy, Air Force to make sure that they realize how important it is what they're doing. My big thing is attraction to Canadian Armed Forces activities. I'm not saying recruiting, I'm saying attraction. And making sure people are aware that this is one of many careers that's available to them and for them to have an appreciation of what the Canadian Armed Forces means to Canada. Cadet retention and growth. So uh, regional growth management tool, how many people uh, are aware of that acronym? Okay, so if you don't, make sure you ask your RCSUs, um, but it's based on the census data of 2016 and we're gonna be working closely with our league partners to identify areas where there may be some growth opportunities based on the number of youth in a certain area. So that is moving forward with uh, our IT SMC that's based in uh, St. Jean for across Canada. So if you need help or you want uh, to explore it additionally, please go through uh, Lieutenant Colonel Letelier and staff. Cadet retention, that's, that's an area that uh, I want to explore. Uh, to give you an appreciation, so I, I believe we had an increase of just over 300 uh, cadets from 2017 to 2018, when you look at it at the end of the calendar year. Um, last year, we uh, enrolled over 28,000 cadets. We also, 28,000 cadets left the program. So just a slight increase of 300. So retention, I, I find, is a key aspect uh, for cadets. And one thing with uh, the stats that have been provided to me, it's primarily after year two that the majority are leaving the program, whether it's for academics, or whether it's for a job, um, uh, rep sports, other commitments. So I would be encouraged to hear from you at the grassroots, is there areas that we could look at to help with the retention of the cadets and I, I'm, I'm, right now I'm focused on year two, but I'm, I'm open to any suggestions and initiatives that uh, may pose positive across the formation. Improve recruitment and retention of COATS members. So this has been a bit of a bugbearer for me. Um, when, I, uh, when the chief and I go across the country and we've had the pleasure of going and doing ACRs and uh, various other meetings, a lot of people come up to us and tell us about some horror stories of the recruitment of uh, uh, becoming a CIC officer, anywhere between one year to four years plus. 
So we have had dialogue uh, meetings with CFRG, uh, the recruiting group in Borden, looking at ways to reduce that timeline in the bureaucracy, looking at uh, medical waivers, um, and trying to find ways to minimize the impact on the enrollees. Um, we're not there yet. We, we do have a new uh, Chief Warrant Officer Cochrane in uh, our strategic headquarters uh, uh, in the recruiting. Significant background and significant networking, which is a key aspect of helping move the files. So we're not there yet, but we do realize that we need to look at like the medical waivers, the PSO interviews, things like that. What I would encourage you at the Corps and Squadron level is if you have some cadets that are interested in becoming CIC officers, have them start the enrollment process when they're age 17, for example. So while they're a cadet, start that enrollment going so it's not hurting where that year plus, where, and then when they age out, it'll be available to them to become a CIC officer. So just food for thought and suggestion. I think we could do a better job at the core and squadron level of explaining to cadets what being a CIC, off, CIC officer, what it, ha, what it brings to the table so they understand your experience and your passion for the program. So I'll leave that food for thought with you and I would be interested in your uh, thoughts either in the Q&A or at the uh, meet and greet uh, this evening. Standardized NDAs and RDAs. One thing I've found is that we are not fully consistent across uh, the country, and that may have to do with geography or cost, and, and it is being looked into. Um, RDAs, uh, I think most people are aware that uh, last year uh, we implemented music as an NDA, uh, and uh, it went extremely well at the, the Halifax Tattoo. Yeah, some challenge space looking at the after action report. Uh, and right now I'm waiting for a briefing in October of the way ahead for 2020 of how we're going to implement the NDA for uh, music. So I think that's a, a really positive element and that can be a huge part of our identity project of music, whether it's in parades or social functions in the community. Strengthen and optimize our formation headquarters. So. After the audit of 2013, the directorate became a formation and the headquarters was decimated number-wise. So basically, I believe in half from, what, from talking with the chief. Right now, we are slowly increasing the numbers in, uh, in the strategic headquarters up to the 87 number. So it's still a very lean headquarters where we want to emphasize the delivery of the program but things such as the J1 admin, the J1 law, J4 log and supply, those are key aspects that I need to make sure we have the requisite number of people to accomplish the task. So when you're pushing stuff up to the RCSU COs and the command teams, making sure that we have the staff at the strat level to make sure that we can implement that, whether it's policy or straight administration. Having one person in the recruiting cell is excellent. I'd like to build that up a bit more. I know people sometimes ask me, Dave, why don't you just take on recruiting for all uh, COATS members? And I, I'm always concerned of, okay, what is the second and third order effect if I were to do that? How many people would I need to run our own recruiting cell? So it's, um, sometimes it's easier said than done, and I always am always looking at the second and third order effects of, if I took that on, I don't want to be the next CFRG. I want to make sure that it is a success story. And I've had some good chats with the command teams on that. Um, and the last one, identify future CTC infrastructure needs. Uh, you may be aware that uh, we have contracted Defence Construction Canada to do a study of uh, all the CTCs of the state of affairs, as well as uh, the regional headquarters. And uh, they are compiling all that and looking at the near-term priorities, medium-term and long-term. There is some crumbling infrastructure out there. With the chief and I uh, having uh, come 17 of the 22 CTCs, infrastructure was the number one issues. Number two was the staffing whether it was the numbers or the level of experience at the, at the various uh, training centers. 
How many people worked at a CTC uh, this summer? Well, that's good, thank you. Well, thank you for taking your summer. I, I know it's not a uh, small effort, but I hope you see the, uh, um, the impact it has on whether it's the staff cadets or the cadets uh, on course. I, I know it's always hard for people, whether it's family uh, considerations or work commitments, so thank you. So more to follow on CTC infrastructure. Uh, to give you an appreciation, right now we, we fall under uh, the, uh, the MFRCs as part of the themes uh, when you're talking about RP Ops uh, with cadets. And that is a very small percentage of the costing for infrastructure. Overall CAF, there, there are significant infrastructure challenges and we're not alone. So it's always hard with priorities, whether it's ops or training or, or support to the cadet program, but we're trying to make sure we get the lay of the land established and then plot a way ahead for the near term, but also looking long term. Next slide. Authority, responsibility, accountability, ARA. How many people have heard that uh, acronym? Okay. So, COs, you are accountable for all aspects of your unit. You're responsible for all your cadet activities. So whether it's training, whether it's exercises, whether it's fundraising, whether it's trips, you are responsible. It is not the support committee, you. So when something happens, I'm looking at, was it a sanctioned event? Are they covered by insurance? Did we provide the proper supervision? And the CEO of the RCSU gets to have a chat with me and he drills down to find out the details. So always have that in the back of your mind of that you are responsible for that. Whatever cadet activity is happening that's impacting one of your cadets in your core and squadron. And you are the authority for your core and squadron. You're responsible for your CIC officers, your civilian instructors, any volunteers that, that are interacting with the cadets, you are, you are responsible for. Big thing is, is remembering your chain of command. That you have your zone training officers and area OICs, but my belly button is the CEO of the RCSU. So Denis, when I have a question, I go to him. I don't go to anybody else for, for Northwest and he responds ASAP. So you have an excellent commanding officer and command team. Which, um, if something happens at your uh, core and squadron, um, it is the CAF that wears it and not another organization. Okay, so keep that in mind when something happens where I get to see all the SIRs, uh, which uh, definitely a bit mind boggling sometimes, uh, different SIRs than I was used to. Um, and when push comes to shove, it's the Canadian Armed Forces that's responsible for the safety of the cadets. So it's not another organization, it is the CAF, okay? So I'm making phone calls to the deputy vice and the vice if something's happened, if, if the cadet has been seriously injured or whether something has happened that may be newsworthy that uh, reaches uh, the senior levels. So something for you to always think about. Something I always grew up uh, going in the CAF is if, if you're sitting here going, geez, I wonder if the boss would want to know that. Probably he does. And that's what I tell my command teams. If in doubt, send me an email because I can look at it quick and go, yep, thanks, Denis. Where others go, ooh. I, I have concerns on this, get me more detail. So when in doubt, report up. Before I finish ARA, I guess, treat this responsibility with priority. You have been given a significant mandate and I, I thank you for your dedication and passion because I know that many of you have full-time jobs and you're trying to manage this with a family as well as uh, uh, work commitments. So I do thank you of your passion for uh, youth development and I do understand there's only so many hours in the day. Next slide. Chief. Merci, mon général. Um, 
So I'm, I'm going to be brief. Uh, I've, I've heard the messaging uh, uh, quite a bit now. Um, I will just talk about uh, very quickly how we work with uh, those organizations, and there's many of them, that support your, your core of squadron. Uh, at the end of the day, it has to be collegial. We have to be, we have to have a common focus, common goal, and that is the cadets. They're, they're our center of gravity. We do this for one reason. We don't do this to wear a uniform. We don't do this, we certainly don't do this for the pay. Uh, and, uh, and we do this for those young Canadians uh, so that they can go on to become great Canadians. So we have to remember that it is a balancing act. When I was a cadet, when the commander was a cadet, uh, we didn't have any sponsoring committees, any, anyone at the core level that, that injected. It just wasn't there then. Then some 30 plus years later, uh, we have a very robust uh, support organization, pretty well for every core. And, and like I say, every core and squadron, uh, it is different. Uh, so so I, there's, there's no way for us to, to zero down on specifics. But the one thing that is crucial, it is crucial that we all understand, is that the commanding officer of the Cadet Corps is ultimately responsible for all activities that transpire with their cadets. Whether that's two cadets going off and doing something, whether that's one cadet going off and, and, and doing an activity, ultimately it is the CO that says, I approve this. And that is critical to understand that, to take that home with you. Because at the end of the day, like the commander says, and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, we have seen some pretty interesting reports come up to the uh, headquarters, I can tell you. At the end of the day, when something goes south, uh, the commander gets the call either from the minister's office, from the CDS's office, or the VCDS's office. Because again, youth development is huge in our country. It is a huge undertaking, and it's not taken lightly, especially at the very senior levels. Um, so at the end of the day, if there is a challenge and we've got to work together. So, so, you know, you've exhausted every possibility you have in order to try to make something work uh, uh, for, the, for, your, for your unit. Um, pick up the phone and, and call your RCSU uh, CO. This is the beauty of being a commanding officer. You have, you have that right. You have that authority to pick up a phone and talk to your next higher commander. Just like Lieutenant Colonel Letelier does frequently with General Cochran. And through discussion and guidance, uh, uh, you, can, you can get things squared away. But don't act on a, on an, on a um, don't make it a knee jerk reaction and start saying no and this and that with your, your supporting uh, elements. Uh, because that just feeds the fire of dissent. And at the end of the day, we all have to be on the same page. So if you have a question, if you have a challenge, feel free to call your CO. Please do. I don't say feel free. I encourage you to. And remember one thing. No one, no one outside the chain of command can exercise authority, responsibility, accountability over your cadets. No one. So again, when things go south, ultimately, uh, we, the uniformed body of this organization, is responsible. So bear that in mind. It's a tremendous responsibility in itself. It's a tremendous responsibility put on us. And uh, we don't take it lightly, and I know none of you take it lightly. So, so bear that in mind, please. And on that note, mon general. Next slide. Uh, decision making at the core squadron level. I think we've uh, talked about this uh, already, just second and third order effects. I can't emphasize enough communication up and down. It's, uh, it's one thing I've learned in my uh, 35 plus years in the military is communication is key. 
you need to make sure you understand my commander's intent with the focus on cadets and my center of gravity being the cadet experience. And as we've highlighted, know that a CO's decision could impact the entire formation. I've seen that several times already. Just so you know that parents have the right, for example, or any, any civilian has the right of writing directly to the minister, or the CDS, the prime minister, and all that stuff ends up on my desk eventually of uh, requests for information. And what, what I would highlight to you is if you see something festering at your core squadron, try to find a solution, okay? If, if you're finding that it's, uh, okay, I don't know what to do on this situation, that's where you start going up the chain and talking to your RCSU CO. Uh, Area OIC and Zone Training Officer may be able to provide some insight but your CSU CO, that's the one that I, my belly button of, hey, Denny, what's going on? So if you see things, because I've seen some pretty bizarre things over this past year, and I, some of, the, some of them could have, been, uh, could have been stopped at the core and squadron level, and it elevated uh, to the minister level where I was engaged, okay? One thing I will talk about is, uh, I know I sent out a commander's letter uh, earlier this year to talk about fees and costs for local accommodation. Um, I was a bit discouraged when basically I got 60% of the returns across all of Canada of the 1,109 corps and squadrons. So um, that was surprising to me, uh, but uh, I, uh, I know I've talked to your CSU CEO. I know everybody has their work commitments, but when something's coming down uh, from the RCSU CO or myself, uh, you should be uh, paying attention to that. You are members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Thanks. Chief. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Next slide. Am I there? Good. So uh, I'll just give you 30 seconds. Just uh, everybody take a few seconds and just read... Uh, Read this, uh, this, uh, this slide uh, quickly. At the end of the day, this is what we want to foster in our cadets, right? And, 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 and quite honestly, on this slide, this is nothing new. This is how we should act. This is, this is common sense, I believe, I would hope, uh, though some folks tend to uh, tend to, uh, to, to not follow some of those principles, but the reality is this makes sense, right? So, so it's, it's a common sense way of acting, and that's what we want to foster in our, in our cadets. We need to show cadets what right looks like, and we do that not only by through lectures and talking to them and that, but we do that through how we work day to day. Everything we do in our cadet program they're watching you. I remember as a cadet, and to this day, I remember, I remember this vividly, uh, you know, 35 plus years later. I would look at my officers, our CIL officers of the day, and I used to be so impressed with my CO, and, and, uh, and we had a pretty unique cadet corps because my CO, uh, his wife was the DCO, and his brother was the admin officer, and his brother's wife was the uh, training officer, so, it was a family affair, but it was fantastic. It changed my life. And I have to tell you, I used to look at these guys not only as the parents of my friends, but I'd look up to them and say, wow, you know what? Um, yeah, I want to be that. And that's really one of the reasons I'm wearing a uniform now and have been for almost 38 years, because of that. So, so you're constantly being that, that example for those kids, whether it's... Uh, whether you're giving a lesson and talking about leadership or not. So, so always bear that in mind. Not only that, you're also the example to the community. So we talk about 1,109 corps and squadrons. Um, across this country, the Canadian Forces doesn't have that visibility. In many cases, you are the only Canadian Armed Forces visibility in your community, depending on where you're from, you know, especially the smaller, uh, smaller communities. And so don't take that lightly. Uh, lightly. It is very, very 
uh, critical, and, uh, and it's positive for us. People, people see you in uniform uh, doing your thing, especially on uh, key dates, Remembrance Day, uh, poppy drives, things of that nature, and it has an impact. So we do have a higher impact than just in the cadet program. We have a much stronger impact across the country. Um, how we view the CIC branch in, in our organization is you are officers in the Canadian Armed Forces, full stop. If you look at the National Defense Act, it actually clearly states that. So I do get a little, and the, the boss knows this, I get a little worked up when people say, well, you know, uh, you've got the P res, oh, and the CIC. Stop that. You're not just the CIC. And I'll talk about that a bit in my closing remarks. So remember that and be proud of that. And this is the kind of thing that we need to, uh, to show, the kind of knowing what right looks like we need to show our cadets. Uh, how many people here have heard of the, the book Duty with Honor? Excellent. Actually, that's, I'm, I'm quite pleased to hear that. Uh, everybody has their own take on it, but it talks about all this stuff up here on the slide. And it goes into some detail. And people interpret it <clears throat> as, they, as, they, uh, as they see fit. But at the end of the day, the first iteration of duty with honor, we weren't involved. We were not part of it. So when they're talking about professionalism and professionals and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the uh, the, uh, the COATS or CIC branch was not part of that discussion. And we've got over 7,500-ish uh, CIC officers, the largest branch in the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, this year, this, they're, they're working on the next iteration, and I don't know when it's going to come out, but we have a seat at the table. We are actually part of that discussion. And we made sure that at the headquarters, because we are part of the Canadian Forces. How can you say we're going to do a survey of the Canadian Forces and how they think, feel about all this stuff and not talk to us? So we have a, a committee that is involved with that and, and hopefully some of you would probably get some feedback from that. But we are part of it. And that goes back to what I said earlier about being a part of the greater CAF community. We now have a seat at the table and that is extremely important. So I would encourage you to even take the duty with honour that's on the street now uh, it's a small book. Have a read of it. And you know what? Get some copies if you can. Let your cadets read it. It's all good stuff. It may be talking about CAF, uh, the Canadian Forces uh, value system and, and, and all that, but this, this, this is common sense stuff. This is how we should act all the time. So on that note, uh, I will... Um, well, I will talk about one more thing, and, and the commander had mentioned it uh, just earlier, was... Um, this all leads to professionalism. And I spend a great deal of my time uh, in Ottawa when I'm at meetings talking about the professional core that is responsible for youth development yourselves uh, at any meetings that I'm at. And that gets tarnished in one millisecond when uh, people start doing things like, like the commander mentioned about sending emails to the minister because uh, for you know some very small thing that could have been addressed through the chain of command because remember we I've wanted a lot of things in my career uh, I haven't gotten them all that's just the way it is sometimes no is the answer but but you can't just because you don't like the answer shoot off uh, in, up to the uh, up to the very top because we are if we are professionals we have a chain of command and we follow that chain of command and so whatever in your unit uh, is, is, is a burning issue, it should come through you to your regional uh, CO, maybe with a phone call and a discussion, and that can be pushed forward, or maybe the answer can come straight out of the regional level. But that is how a professional military works. So in this day and age of social media, I get it, I understand, our, our, our young people are a different uh, different than we are, and that is fine, that is, that is evolution, that is moving forward. But please understand that all the push that we, we do to support the branch and say we are professionals in the profession can be tarnished very, very quickly by one person with one email. So just keep that in mind, please. 
uh, that's what that's what uh, that's what being a, a it's a bit about what being a leader is all about. Thank you. Next slide. So, in summary, I, I know uh, we've been going on for a little while, and I want to definitely get to, to the questions. Um, the key thing is enjoy command. I, I've had the pleasure, the distinct pleasure and honor of commanding of uh, squadron, base, formation, and there's nothing better uh, than command. So you are responsible for your unit, your corps, your squadron. You're not on an island by yourself. Remember that. Look at all your colleagues around you. You have other people you can bounce ideas off of. You have the chain of command. You have your RCSU command team. Don't forget that, okay? And I do want to thank you for your dedication and passion where you have a significant impact on the future of Canada with youth development. So thank you for your time of being commanding officers. I know it's not an easy job and yet I'm sure you have a great team that you can help mentor and develop. And I, uh, I do encourage, I'm encouraged to see the passion and the delivery of the program um, and I'm extremely proud uh, to be uh, your commander, so thank you, Chief. Uh, <clears throat> Merci, Monsieur. The uh, the commander uh, he he just basically said it. At the end of the day, uh, it is absolutely incredible. I've been watching the uh, the questions going up there, and I saw a few that were quite interesting. And yes, you all punch well above the bar uh, in what you do. We know, we know. Uh, you know, in the month of, uh, what was it, uh, June, July, and into August, I think, uh, I, uh, you know, I had five days off, and that was including weekends, and uh, that was us flying all over Canada. But it's great, and I know why we do this. Um, you're here for passion and not, uh, and not a paycheck, and that's for, for sure. Um, you are the pointy end of the spear in the National Cadet and Junior Canadian Ranger Support Group, in our L2, in our formation. You are. You're at the grassroots, you're at the cold face, and everything happens there. And we are very aware of that, and we are very appreciative of it. So please bear that in mind. Uh, I, would, I would like to say one thing, and I say this when I speak at the SOTC course and a few other places, is never underestimate the importance and the impact that you have uh, on Canada. So <clears throat> every... Every week, a, the parents of this country trust you and trust their children to you for one night a week, a weekend or two a month, summer training sessions, and all the other events that we, we undertake. They're entrusting the most important aspect of their family into your hands, into our hands. That cannot be taken lightly. That cannot be taken lightly. That's not like passing the keys to your car to go to a buddy for a weekend. That is critical. So I hope the enormity of that uh, hits home because it does with me and it does with our headquarters. We know how important success in this program is and how things can go south very quickly. And we know this all happens because of the work you do. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Uh, absolutely, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. And. Uh, Sir, I suppose we can open it up to, uh, to discussion. I'll see.